And when you hear the term that I believe Lori just used, apologetics, that's kind of the technical theological term for what I do. Some people introduce me as an apologist and an evangelist. That does not mean that I walk around the world telling people about Jesus and apologizing for doing so. It comes from a Greek word, apologia, which means basically to give a reasoned defense or a persuasive explanation of the Christian faith. And so tonight, um, I've been asked to speak on when God's rules seem too tough, love, sex, and relationships. So I gave you these cards because things I say might go, really? I, I haven't thought of that that way. Or, or that actually leads me to ask more questions. And one of the things that we always do, regardless of the subject and regardless of the um, audience that we're speaking to, is we leave it open for a time of Q&A. So I do want you to ask your questions, questions that come up from the topic or questions that you've just had on the subject that you've thought, I, I really haven't asked anybody this and I'd like to. We're gonna have live questions if you'd like that, but I also know that some people like to write them down, so please feel free. So um, hold on to these and there's pens in front of you. And like I've just said, giving a defense of the Christian faith, you might be thinking, so why is the topic on sex and relationships tonight? And I want to tell you, I've been doing um, this ministry full-time now for six years. But before that, I was a full-time university student chaplain for University of Oxford students for seven years, helping students, arguably some of the brightest around the world, either figure out if they came to university with any type of traditional faith, why they would want to keep it, when everybody in the academy, specifically Oxford, said they should be too smart for it, or some of the top minds around the world coming to the university, probably having the worldview, that term just means the lens through which you understand the world, saying the reason I got here is because I'm so intelligent, I don't need things like faith. And then they get where they've always hoped for, and they haven't been able to answer the questions of life, and really their lives just plummet as they go, I need questions to where I've come from, how do I make decisions, what do I do with this excellent life degree? I've been given. And so for seven years before doing this, I wrestled with hard questions of faith. And even before that, I was raised in a Christian family in Central Florida before moving to Oxford. The first time I left home was to move to Oxford. Central Florida, born and raised. I'm so happy to be back in the sunshine, folks. So happy. But I touched down, and it was snowing, okay? And I was young for university, and you had to walk miles to get everywhere in the UK. If you've been, I have this way too much luggage. I've learned to pack since then. And I think I lived on Cheerios and Tetley's tea for two weeks because it was the first time I had moved from home. But across all of those different experiences of life and wrestling with my own questions, do I believe in this faith I've been given. Is it my own? And then wrestling with it when I was in Oxford and then wrestling with other students and now around the world. Although people have intense questions about science, about philosophy, about many different things, you would not believe, or maybe you do, which is why you're here tonight, how much the background, one of the biggest barriers to entry to belief in God, to wrestling with the, the Christian faith, to sticking with the Christian faith, or even saying, I want to be a Christian, has to do with this idea of, even if you prove to me it's true, even if you prove to me that it's good news, either the background that I have or the way that I'm living my life currently excludes me from it, or what I would have to give up to be a Christian to say it is true and I want to live that way, it's too much. So I would say this is actually one of the biggest apologetic topics. And definitely going to university campuses, we have loads of questions on the area. So that's why I wanted to frame it with tonight. And I want you to not be discouraged if you have felt in one of those categories before. And another way I like to title this talk sometimes is, isn't Christian Christianity just exclusive and restrictive? Even if you prove it all to me, Michelle, even if you prove to me that God exists with all of the great apologetics, even if you show to me that his offer and what he did on the cross is amazing. At the end of the day, my biggest beef with God, the reason I don't want to be a Christian or the reason I don't want to be a Christian anymore, the way it gets phrased, is because God has all these laws and all these rules. And the Bible sets up all these things that excludes my best friends and the way they live their lives 
or excludes the way I feel attracted or it restricts me with the way that I can practice love and relationships. So thank you, but no thank you. I will leave that offer to the good Christians and that doesn't include me. I remember meeting my husband for the first time and um, I met him in Oxford. We were kind of geeks. We met over a Greek class in Oxford. Um, he comes from a, a missionary family and so he's very international, but his mother's family is from uh, North Carolina, Wilmington, North Carolina. They were good Southerners, proper manners. My family's Italian, New York, and so he always said we were Yankees and didn't have good manners like him, right? And I didn't actually get a chance to meet his grandfather um, before we started dating. And he used to tell me lots of stories about his grandfather. And the one main advice that his grandfather gave all of his grandchildren and his mother still remembers it, that he wanted to pass down about Christian virtues was if you can follow these rules in life, don't drink, smoke, or chew, or go with girls that do, that will sort you out in life. And, you know, a lot of people, we laugh at that, but people think Christianity, and we think that about sums up what the Bible says about behavior. That about sums up what Jesus says about the way that you can live your life. So if I'm going to be a Christian, great. All these you can't. And if I'm going to have a relationship, even double, you can't. And I think sometimes our society our own hearts have given up on the Christian faith because we have judged it based on other religious people's explanations thereof or the restrictions that we have seen. We've judged Jesus Christ and his offer of good news and relationship by what religious people have said about him. And sometimes, and I'll include myself in it, sometimes we as a religious community, in trying to convey hope, I think sometimes with the best intentions at heart, in trying to protect people, have set up something that looks exclusive at best and very restrictive and repressive at worst. Have you ever come across some of those um, Google things if you're bored that shows the worst church signs? Don't worry, I checked your sign. It doesn't say any of these things. We're all okay. One of them that I came across that just shows the exclusion, if you put the first one up, free coffee, everlasting life. Yes, membership has its privileges. Right up there, sign me up. I want to be a Christian. Free coffee, everlasting life, definitely. You know, and it's funny, and it's not that bad compared to some of the signs. But once again, as long as you're a member, as long as you join our denomination, you'll get lots of free things. If not, well, you're not a member. Membership has its privileges. You don't know how many churches I know that use that byline, which I think is originally from member, um, American Express or something. What about the next one with restrictive no tricks, no trunks, no treats, just truth. If I was a kid, I'd be like, man, please don't bring me there around. At least have a light party or something. They're like, don't worry. We're not, we don't have to have anything else, just the truth. It's all you need. We're going to restrict all fun. Don't, that's how you get to God. And really, it's, it's, a, it's a view that society has, and sometimes it's for a good reason. But I want to really push into those words tonight exclusive and restrictive because I really do think that that is bound up in the main issue of love, sex, and relationship. Maybe people don't ever phrase them that way, but they think I'm excluded if I practice my relationship and love this way from Jesus. Or if I even want to consider Christianity, it's going to restrict the way I can think or act or there's too many restrictions. Let's look first at that definition of exclusive. I got a little bit addicted to looking things up in the Oxford English Dictionary when I was in Oxford, I have to be honest. And so the OED, I don't use Webster as much anymore, I'm sorry, says that exclusive means first, it gives three definitions, excluding or not admitting other things, of terms excluding all but what is specified. So why do I put that out there? This exclusive, exclusivity word has become a buzzword in our society. Don't be exclusive. You have to include everybody. But we forget that just in philosophical terms itself, just by the way you define it, by this definition, excluding or not admitting other things, everything in life is exclusive. For instance, to say I am a woman, I must, to define myself, I must exclude being a man. You get that, right? To say, um, I am in America. I've just excluded the fact that I am at the same time living in the UK. So by this pure definition of what exclusive means, Christianity is exclusive. But so is every other faith 
and every other worldview. Because to say, I am an atheist, it means I am excluding the Christian worldview from my definitions in life. To say I am a Hindu, it means I have excluded the Buddhist way of life. I have excluded the Muslim way of life. To say I am a universalist, I am completely inclusive, then you have just excluded every other worldview that says you have to exclude something. Do you get it? Don't be fooled by this thing that only the Christian faith and all these rules make our faith so exclusive. What's the next definition of exclusion? Restricted to a certain person, group, or area. And this is another definition that many people go, exactly, Christianity. One of the main questions I get over and over again, well, it's easy to be a Christian if you grew up in America. Easy to be a Christian if you grew up in the United States, which once again is usually only said in the United States because everyone else says, well, we're America and Canada. Oh, we're America and Peru, right? But then why are the largest groups of people growing in the Christian faith in places where it is illegal? You can be put to death. Why? There shouldn't be Christianity growing. So no, I would say definitely not. Christianity is not restricted to a certain person or group or era and has never been, which I'm going to push into in a second when we look at our text. It has always been radically inclusive. It has always been available for every single person, any single group, any single age, any single area. And finally, catering for are only available to few select customers. Once again, absolutely not. At its heart, Christianity is completely the opposite. So what about restrictive? Before we push into a really well-known story of the Bible that's going to really frame some of these questions about sex and relationship. The definition for restrictive is limiting or depriving, especially on someone's activities of freedom. And there's the ticker. Okay, well, you just said to me that Christianity was completely e exclusive. If you define it that way, play those word games, Michelle, maybe. You're right. But restrictive, I definitely have you there. Limiting, depriving, especially our activities and freedoms, love, sex, and relationships. Let me tell you, the very first time I was asked to give a talk for um, our global team. It was for the University of Reading, and I was asked by um, the head of the UK and um, Asia. He said, you know, there's a whole bunch of talks that we're doing. I, I really can't do all of them. Would you come and give a few of them? Getting closer and closer to the event. I'm not getting the topics from him. Finally, the event is nearly upon us. I'm like, what are these topics? He's like, well, really, there's only one. I'm like, okay. And he's like, but you're the first talk of the week of talks that we're giving in the center of the university. And it starts on Valentine's Day. I'm like, oh great, this is getting bad. And it's on sex. They've asked us to speak on sex, why wait? And I'm kicking off a week of evangelism to a huge public university, and he pushes me out there to talk on sex, why wait? And when we show up, if I'm not scared enough going, why would the Christian campus group decide to do a talk against sex on Valentine's Day first? Come be a Christian. Give up sex. Yay. You know? I mean, pretty much that's how they framed it. Not only did they decide that with their organization, they had huge signs they had made up. Sex, why wait? Sex this way. With an arrow to the hall that I was speaking in. So you can just imagine the entire, the entire place was packed. And I'm like, oh, no. And then they proceeded to ask me icebreaker questions to try to make everybody feel better. They were all about fruit, and you can just imagine it all went wrong. It all went wrong. So that's the first time. But once again, why do I share that? This has always been an issue. People have questions. So what does it actually mean to be a Christian? It means being a follower of Jesus. I like to say to my daughter, she's six years old, and she's wrestling with this on her own, it means to be a friend of Jesus. Being a Christian is not actually about following a huge set of rules. Being a Christian is not actually about doing intellectual exercises and proving that God exists. Being a Christian is not actually about having a mystical spiritual experience that then you know I've had an emotional experience. Now, all of those things or none of those things or some of those things may and do happen to people that identify as being a Christian. But being a Christian means one thing and one thing alone. It means accepting that Jesus was and is all that he always claimed to be. 
that he is not only the evidence for the existence of a real and loving God, but he's the best evidence that this is good news, that this God is an inclusive God that loves people, that has gone out of his way across history to say, even when people don't behave like they want or need me, I'm going to cross the barrier to come to them, to show them I exist and I'm really for them. Maybe our world has never understood Christianity that way. And maybe we don't really trust that Christianity is really about that because we've been defining Christianity based on what other people said about Jesus rather than looking at him. And with the rest of our time before q and I want to look at a picture of Jesus that frames us personally with who he is and what he says to our hearts about love and relationships. It comes from John chapter 8, verses 2 through 11. It's a familiar story, a story of a woman caught in adultery. I'm not going to actually have the words come up. If you want to turn to it, you can. But I want to just encourage you maybe to press into the stories of hearing the story for the first time. Maybe shut your eyes or just tune in. I'll read the story and then we'll talk about it. Early in the morning... He came again to the temple, that's Jesus. All the people came to him, and he sat down and he taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? And they said to him, to test him. They said this to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask them, he stood up and he said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more, he bent down and he wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up And he said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. What does this story tell us about Jesus? And what does this story tell us about us? Before we throw it open to questions. First, what does this story tell us about Jesus? It tells us he is radically inclusive. Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Now, this was a trap that the religious leaders of the day had set for Jesus. How do we know it was a trap? It says, and they did this to trap him. (laughs) It's pretty clear. Why was it such a trap? Because really, in the law of Moses, what was written was that if a woman was caught in adultery, first off, if a woman's caught in adultery, adultery is an active event. You're supposed to bring both parties if someone is caught in adultery. And actually, you're not supposed to bring them before anyone. Those who find the witness are able, if they want, to exact justice, to stone them on the spot. What happens here? Only a woman is dragged before Jesus. The fact that they say it's a trap leaves most commentators to say people were lying in wait. So that talks about the morality of the whole situation anyway, that people knew what was going on, that people, religious leaders were watching and waiting for something like this, that they only brought the woman before Jesus, that they didn't act in the name of holiness. They decided to make a spectacle of this woman. It's a trap. And why is it a trap? Because if Jesus were to say, go ahead then, stone her, he would have to go directly to prison because he's taking the Roman authorities into his hand. They weren't allowed to kill people based on their religious law, and he would have gone directly to be killed. If he says, you know what, don't do anything, all of the people that had been daring to believe that God was a little different and more merciful and more amazing, they'd be overwhelmed. But then what would happen? What would he have said of God? God doesn't care. He would be invalidating the law. He was trapped whichever way he went. But what does he do? He's Jesus. He's never trapped. He turns everything on its head and says, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone. See, Jesus broke every single religious box that had ever been known and ever was made. He showed that this message 
was a message for all people. That this message of radical inclusion, this message of radical love, of radical forgiveness, of radical wisdom and justice was different than what anybody would have ever expected. And we see this just by the way that the canon is passed on to us. It's written in Greek. Why is it not written in what they were speaking? Because people knew that this message of who God is needed to get out to as many people as possible, as fast as possible. It's been valid across every single age. People have told this story and told these stories of who Jesus was. And it is a message with every breath and everything that Jesus did. He said, those who are cultural outsiders are actually allowed to be close to God. Those who are racial outsiders are allowed to be close to God. Those who are religious outsiders are allowed to be close to God. Economic outsiders are close to God. And even gender and moral outsiders, I'm bringing you closer to God than you ever thought was allowable or possible. His very presence, his very life showed that God was and always has been radically inclusive. If you read a very modern translation of the Bible called The Message, whenever it talks about what Jesus was doing and tells a parable, almost always directly following it, it repeats this word, this is the great reversal. Jesus flipped every stereotype of who God was on its head. And actually, he was so radically inclusive, he got him killed. That's the story of Easter. And Galatians 3.20, Paul goes to talk about this message of God. He says, so in Christ Jesus, you're all children of God. There isn't Jew or Gentile. There isn't slave or free. There's not even male or female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. Every single thing that humanity had tried to say, these differences make you more important or less important before God. Jesus did away with it all and said, I'm here for you. I'm God, and I say you're important. Come to me. Decide for yourself about my claims. Come close to me and see if you want a way of life with me. So it shows us that Jesus is radically inclusive. Secondly, it shows us that he is completely freeing. What does that mean? Jesus stood up and said to her, it says in the text, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Now what happens here? Not only, not only does Jesus break every single box that was ever known about who could get close to God, but he not only says, I'll come close to you, he says, I do not condemn you. What do you think those words said to that woman? What do you think those words say to us across history? It's so much more than just rules and regulations when God comes near. He comes near, nearer to any of us. The Bible says we're all sinners. We've all messed up. We've all broken his law. We've all broken his heart. Not only does he not say clean up, and then you can become a member, and now membership has its privileges. He draws near to us when everybody else is pointing their finger saying, you're too dirty. You're too broken. The way you're practicing your love life and your relational life is too far away. He pushes right past those people that put up barriers. He comes close, and after he comes close, he says, no shame. I do not condemn you. But here's the kicker. In order for Jesus to be able to say then to that woman and for every single heart and every single person across time, neither do I condemn you. It costs Jesus the hell of Calvary. It costs Jesus everything. You see, it was a trap, like I said. And in answering the way he did, although it got him out of the immediate trap of being mobbed by people or being killed by the Roman authorities, his pronouncing her shame-free, his speaking words of wisdom, him practicing a radical inclusion and a complete freedom of people where he was forgiving sins when only God himself could forgive sins meant a cost had to be paid because forgiveness always comes at a cost. Healing, shame going away, brokenness being restored always comes at a cost. So Jesus is completely freeing. But his pronouncement over her and over all of our lives when we fall short cost him his very life cost him everything. 
So he's radically inclusive. He's completely freeing. But finally, he's also the defender of love. What does he say to her? The story could have ended with, now I don't condemn you. You're fine. We're all good. He looks at her decisively and says, go and from now on, sin no more. And that's where I want to pick up a few specifics before throwing it over to your questions. So how do we define sin? Why was that important for Jesus to say, even though he was being radically inclusive and completely said, no shame on you? And why is it still important today when we learn to present a Christian faith that says God is completely for you and he wants to know you and you don't have to clean yourself up? How do we understand and wrestle with sin in our own lives? How do we speak about sin to a culture that has lost that word completely and doesn't understand it, that sees sin only as rules rather than something more important? You see, do you remember when Jesus was asked, teacher, what is the greatest commandment? And he was able to sum all 613 laws up into one main thing, love God and love others. And he said, if you fulfill this one thing, you fulfill all the laws. It's all about love. So the more I've studied this, the more I've done work on love and relationship, I believe the opposite is then the truth. How do we define sin? If you can fulfill every single law just by loving God and loving others, then sin is the violation of love. We sin whenever we do not love God first and we practice any type of love and relationship that has not put him first and brought real love to life in our lives. Sin is the violation of love. That falls under every category. You want to put words, you want to put specifics on us, and it's still, at the end of the day, the violation of who God is. God is love. And he is the defender of love, which is why, even though he's radically inclusive and completely freeing, he does protect love, sex, and relationship with a vengeance. And so the main question that comes up is, great, he's the defender of love. Well, why should he care so much about what I do in the bedroom? Maybe you've thought that before. Maybe you've been asked that before by your friends. Why? I mean, think about today's world. Isn't this getting old-fashioned? Why would God expect anyone to commit to a relationship without first testing it out physically? Nobody does that. At least that's what the world thinks. At least, actually, let's not put it on the world. Within the church, a lot of people rationalize the same thing. Isn't it dangerous to repress our natural urges? Don't we just end up producing a whole generation of sheltered Christian kids that are repressed and don't really know how to do relationship? Why would God prevent people from having sex with whomever they want as long as they really love each other? These questions have come throughout history. They're not new. But God is the defender of love. But even with stating that, it seems confusing. It can seem confusing. We shouldn't make light of it or just go, well, it's what the Bible says. It's easy. We can say it's what the Bible says, but we need to wrestle with the reality of the fact that across all ages, all times, all cultures, all people, dare I say, there's struggles. It's been hard. It's been an issue. It continues to be an issue because it is an issue. And it can seem confusing that a God of love would put so many serious restrictions on the way that we can pursue love. And off the back of that, I just want to ask a question. Why do you think it is that humans react so strongly to rules about relationships? Why? Have we always reacted that way? And something inside all of us, even the goody two-shoes amongst us, which I am a self-described one of those. I was the worst firstborn for the rest of my siblings. There was four of us. Pretty much, you said no, I said yes, okay, that's fine. The rest, I'm like, why? Why did you have to make things so hard for us? I think we all react strongly to rules about relationships because relationships mean so much to us. We all look to relationships for meaning, for purpose, for our identity. And so because of that, it's really easy and natural, I would add, to get defensive if and when they're challenged, whether that's being challenged by our teachers, our parents, society, God, or anybody else. But what I love to do when I'm talking about the Christian faith and how actually it has so much to say 
about love and relationships is say that actually the Christian faith not only acknowledges the strong link between relationships and meaning, but actually only the Christian faith explains why all of humanity and all human beings all seem hardwired to be relationship junkies. It's the truth. We are all relationship junkies junkies in some way shape or form maybe it's not the romantic fairy tale way but for friendships we crave community we crave relationship we crave people to connect with us why do you think the social media rage is going on so much people just want to connect well the christian faith doesn't say ignore it just deal with the rules it's easy the christian faith gives us the vocabulary for why we all are so hardwired to be hell-bent on finding relationships that give us meaning, that give us identity. See, the Bible tells us that we crave relationship because God designed us that way. But the problem, of course, is that until we come to know and accept true love from God, we will be trying to fill that relational void in all sorts of different ways. And that's what humanity's been doing for all time. We're created for relationship. We're hardwired to be seeking relationship with the living God who's always been a God of relationship because he's the Trinity. God's never been alone. He's never been lonely. The Christian God is a God who's always known perfect, unbroken, unrestrained, intimate relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And human beings are the overflow of perfect love and relationship. The love and relationship found in God was so good that God created human beings just for the opportunity of us being able to know good and perfect relationship. And so we're all hardwired to find and base our hopes and dreams on finding friendship and relationship because we're created for his perfect friendship and relationship. But you see, our disordered desire for God has resulted in a disordered and I would say destructive desire for people. That's the story of humanity. Our disordered desire for God has resulted in a disordered and destructive desire for people. We are supposedly living in the most sexually inclusive and limitless time. And where has that left most of our love lives? I mean, as never before, we are living in in this age and stage where you can get anything you want, where laws are being changed to make free relationship, love, and sex, easier and easier, and yet, where are our love lives? I'll tell you where it is. In 2012, the number one question typed into Google internationally was, what is love? You hear that? The number one question. And what does that tell us? Everybody is searching for it, and nobody knows how to get it. Everybody. And I want to just read a quick um, quote by, actually, it's, 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 it's an excerpt of a play of, um, a brand new um, Vanity Fair article that came out in August called Tinder and the Dawn of the Dating Apocalypse. Some of you in here might know what Tinder is. I read this to show the age we're in. We are pretty much are in an age where with the advent of different social media, those of you who haven't heard of it, don't worry, but Tinder is basically an app where people can pretty much, by looking at pictures, swipe to the left, swipe to the right, hook up with anybody within a mile radius of them, and people are on it all the time. And they're constantly connecting with men and women that they've never met before just to have one night, one hour, two minute stands, all based on how a person looks. You swipe to the right or swipe to the left. It's a huge phenomenon around the globe right now. And Vanity Fair, a woman called Nancy Jo Sales, wrote Tinder and the Dawn of the Dating Apocalypse. And I'm just gonna read an excerpt because I think it paints perfectly This picture of a limitless, no rule society that we've always wanted that we now have. And where does it leave us? What happens after you've come of age in the age of Tinder? That would be the students in here. Coming of age in the age of Tinder. Will people ever be satisfied with a sexual or even emotional commitment to one person? And does that matter? Can men and women ever find true intimacy in a world where communication is mediated by screens or trust? where they know their, par- their partner has an array of other easily accessible options. According to Christopher Ryan, one of the co-authors of Sex at Dawn, human beings are not sexually monogamous, mon- monogamous by nature. I think the spectrum of human sexuality appears to be getting more colorful and broader and very rapidly, Ryan says. I think a lot of people are still interested in having long-term, stable, deep connections to one 
or a few people, he says. We as a species value intimacy and authenticity very highly. On the other hand, we're very attracted to novelty. So people are going to go ahead and have sex with the people they're attracted to, as they've always done. And it's a good thing for everyone if that becomes accepted and not censured by church or by state. Listening to him talk, she says, I could only think, if only it were that easy. In a perfect world, we'd all have sex with whomever we want, and nobody would mind, or be judged, or get dumped. But what about jealousy? Sexism? Not to mention the still flickering chance that somebody might actually fall in love. Jesus is a defender of love. He defends love for a reason. Because when we get to a point, and it's happened again and again in culture, where actually all of those rules we thought were so passe are removed, we're still broken. We're still hungry. We're still looking for something. And the reason there are such protections around the way sex and relationship and love is practiced in the Bible is because for the Christian and the Christian worldview, sex is actually sacred. Because it is modeled after a sacred love. It's about total union and unrestricted intimacy. Sex is the physical, relational, here on earth, closest thing we get to being able to physically say, all of me for all of you, always. And it is protected because it's sacred because it is supposed to mirror the unrestricted, perfectly selfless, perfectly sacrificial, and perfectly eternal love found in the character and nature of God. It's that valuable. It's that sacred. That's what it's about, which is why it is so protected. See, sex means more than just a certain action or behavior. It's a promise. It's mystical. It's sacred. It's modeled on the sacred love of who God is. All of me for all of you, always. In 1 Corinthians 6, 16 through 20, and I'm coming to the end, the message version describes sex beautifully, and I want you to read this because you've probably not read it in this translation. There's more to sex than mere skin on skin. Sex is as much spiritual mystery as physical fact. As written in scripture, the two become one. Since we want to become spiritually one with the master, we must not pursue the kind of sex that avoids commitment and intimacy, leaving us more lonely than ever. The kind of sex that can never become one. There is a sense in which sexual sins are different from all others. In sexual sin, we violate the sacredness of our own bodies. These bodies that were made for God-given and God-modeled love for becoming one with another. You see, all of those people are typing in what is love on Google, and we have the answer. God is love. But how often have we said that and not made that have any connection with our love and relationship? See, when the Christian says God is love, it's less about describing who God is and more about giving us a framework for what real love is. And when we say God is love as a Christian, theologically and relationally, what we mean is true love is always relational. It's never just individually based because God's always been relational. It's always sustained through sacrifice, like Jesus on the cross. God the Father always preferring the Son, the Son always preferring the Spirit, and back and forth. So it is relational, it is sustained through sacrifice, and it's eternal. It always has been, it always will be. You don't have to live going, will this relationship and this sacrifice only last as long as I will? That's why sex is protected. Because it's mystical, it's about becoming one with God, and then we become one with others, mirrored on that type of commitment. And because sex is sacred, it is protected for a reason, the Bible says. In Matthew 19, 5, echoing the Genesis mandate, Jesus says, for this reason, because it's sacred, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. You see, sex is sacred because it's modeled on a sacred love, a love that is about becoming one. Sex is life uniting, you could say. It's because something actually does happen during sex that sex is so controversial. 
It comes so close to the moral and spiritual good that sex within marriage is and should be that it literally rips us apart when it's over and we haven't practiced it within those bounds, leaving us broken, withdrawn, desperate for more, almost like an addict. I think that describes every single person that has ever dabbled in those areas. And actually, it doesn't even take the Bible to say that. Cameron Diaz's character in Vanilla Sky, a Spanish film that was remade with uh, Tom Cruise a while ago, said this, there's no such thing as casual sex. Don't you know when you sleep with someone, your body makes a promise whether you do or not? We understand it deep within our human psyche. It's because something actually does happen that when it's not practiced in this sacred, protected way, we are literally ripped apart. Don't you know your body makes a promise whether you do or not? So where does that leave us with the story of the woman caught in adultery before your questions? Well, I think it means that we're all the woman caught in adultery in the story. And what do I mean by that? You might be getting really bristly. Oh, not me. I've never been caught in adultery. Not me. The rules make sense. Everything you explain makes sense. I have always kept them. Not me. I don't struggle. But you see, when people say to you, and this is a very common argument these days, you see, it was only Paul, and it was only the church later that gives parameters for sex. Jesus never set up anything specific. Sex for a reason, like I just talked about in Matthew, shows exactly the type of parameters that Jesus set. And the parameters that Jesus set, although he has always been and always will be radically inclusive, completely freeing, regardless of whether we've behaved right or now, because he is the defender of love, he always intensified morality rather than bringing it down. And what does he put as the standard for protecting this life-uniting, sacred sex? He says, for this reason, right, a man will leave his father and mother be united to a woman, a wife, and the two will become one flesh. What God has joined together, let no one separate. That gives us three parameters for sex that Jesus said. You can actually do away with everything else. I'm not telling you to, but what Jesus said about sex. He says it's between a man and a woman, very clearly. Guess what? That was radically offensive even in Jesus' time. People for all ages have struggled and wrestled with same-sex attractive attraction, always, honestly, it's nothing new. That would have been just as hard for people in society to hear then as it is now. What else did he say? It's only for marriage. That it, that's what it meant, that they left their father and mother and they're united to each other. Once again, for all times, that would have been radically shocking and hard because maybe within the Jewish community they had marriage uh, big hooplas and the hoopa and everything else that they used with it. But all across time, people were practicing sexuality outside of marriage. Jesus comes and says, it's only between a man and a woman, and you can only have it when you're married. All of society would be going, really? Really? That's not a new culturally thing that's, oh, no, we're, we're so past it. We're so old-fashioned. That was always shocking. So he says it's between a man and a woman. It's only for marriage. And here's the final one. It's eternal. It's for life. Divorce rates have never been higher. Within the church and outside the church, we've all struggled. And even if divorce is not an option or an issue, there are a lot of people that live marriages struggling to walk out. It's for life. So I'll repeat it again. What does this story tell us about Jesus? That he's radically inclusive. He's different. He says, you're broken. We're all broken. I guarantee you at some point in time, every person in this building and every person you come across with has or will struggle with one of those issues that Jesus sets out. That it's only between a man and a woman, that it's only for marriage, and that it's for life, no questions asked. I guarantee you all of humanity at some point have struggled with one of those standards. But he says, I include you. You're not excluded if you're struggling. You're free from the struggle because I made the sacrifice to set you free and for you to come close and learn to walk out the struggle with me. And I will be the defender of love. 
if you will look at the claims of my life, if you will be honest about how difficult this is, but not make that run away from me, but come to me and walk with me and keep talking about it, keep asking questions, keep being honest about your struggles. Keep getting help. Keep talking to me and to people of God. Not only will it defend you from leaving you broken by uniting yourself and your emotions and your heart and then ripping it apart, but it will fill you with that meaning and that purpose and that identity that we've all been looking for in other people in such a way that it will free you to be a defender of love for other people. You won't be looking at love and relationships or your marriage or your friendships or your parenting just based on what I've gotten and what I've put into it. You'll be able to be set free from that selfish, sucking in, individual state of nature, survival of the fittest view of love that all of us are prone to because he comes and fills us with his real relationship and radically changes us so we can be the defender of love for other people instead of being the one always looking for love for ourselves. It's an amazing offer. God's rules are amazing, and they're freeing, and they will radically change our lives and societies, but we have to be able to wrestle with them the right way. So thank you for your time. It's a big topic, I know. As we end this and go into a time of q and I just wonder if there are some people here that maybe, maybe they thought, you know what? I, I need to revisit this for my own heart. I want to accept his inclusion of me. I want to realize I don't have to run away from God or hide from him, that he's been running to me, that his view of me and his offer of shame being away will change me and empower me to live in a new way, can change my natural urges, can give me ways to walk out what seems impossible to me, holding him by the hand. And if that's you, I just want to give an opportunity for you to either write a question, to ask that more, to figure out if you need some more resources to be able to do that and get some follow-up with some of the leaders here, or to maybe just make that personal between gods. If you wouldn't mind, I just want to give you a space to bow your head. I'm going to say a quick prayer um, that's basically about good manners. I teach Sophia the same thing. That brings our hearts before God and say, I want to just accept your inclusion of me. And then we'll go into Q&A. Does that sound okay? All right. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you're real and that you're God and that you love us and that what you showed us of yourself was radical. And what you call us to is radical. But that you are the defender of our hearts. You're the defender of our relationships. And you come close to make us able to love the way that you called us to love. So, Lord, we're sorry if we have um, thought that we could figure things out better on our own or thought that we were exempt from the, stu the struggle. Please, will you come and forgive us where we have judged you or judged others or judged ourselves based more on what we thought than on what you said? And thank you that you include us in this offer of love is for us and our hearts tonight. In your precious name we pray, amen. Thank you guys so much. So if you have some questions, um, I'd love to take them uh, for a few more minutes if we have some time for some questions still, do we? Yeah, we have some time for some questions. Given everything that you said from a practical perspective, what does dating look like? Dating for high school, yeah college students yeah and what does it look like for parents what 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 would be points of wisdom yeah. for parents in dating that's a really really good question um why i gave that message translation of one corinthians six i've done a lot of work reading into that recently i think it actually gives some really good parameters not just for dating but but the dreaded question of every youth worker uh, how far is too far then what do you do you know, I like how it talks about I'm just maybe going to walk through it again really quickly. Um, it says, since we want to become spiritually one with the master, we must not pursue the kind of sex that avoids commitment and intimacy, leaving us more lonely than ever. And I know you're like, I said dating, not sex, you know. But I think this is important, that if this whole idea of relationship and the whole idea of why I would say a Christian would even be 
beginning to pursue relationship is to learn what love looks like, right? I think we need to be careful. I was raised in the generation, and it's okay, I mean, even if you phrase it this way, of, you know, don't date till you're ready to get married, which is good. I understand that. But I also think that there's something about relationship in Christian settings that is really good to learn how to do life and relationship together between girls, between girls and guys. You don't have to call that dating if you feel uncomfortable with that as a parent. It can be groups. But I think that if we always put, you know, you're not allowed to date till you're married or you're not allowed to date till you're ready to make a commitment, then there can put so much fear of learning what it is to, to, to learn relationship, to learn sacrifice, to learn forgiveness, to learn what it means to walk with people through things and to talk honestly about where we're at and how do our honest thoughts glorify God? Are our heart's desires being met by him mostly or are we looking to each other to fulfill everything? So guidelines for dating. Um, it talks about... Um, in sexual sin, we violate the sacredness of our own bodies. These bodies that were made for God-given and God-modeled love were becoming one. I'd say good parameters start with any type of dating that my daughter or, you know, not at six in the future, or um, students that I've counseled, youth groups are looking at, what are our goals? You set out our goals. We are made, not just for romantic relationship, but we're made for God-given, God-modeled love right? To become one. That doesn't mean just sex, okay? We can become one, like-minded, right? We can become one in the way that we view the world and shape our worldview. So we need to become one in a God-modeled way. God never offers himself and his relationship to anybody without giving it in a way that is always about the other person, so not individually focused. So that's a good parameter for dating to start with. Am I looking to start dating because I am so lonely and everyone else is doing it and it's something having to do with I? You get it? So God modeled. It's always about the other. It's not about what I need because what I need is already being fulfilled by God. So that's already good starting at a baseline of talking about that with our youth and our children. Why are you wanting to pursue dating? What are you looking for? If it is me focused already, there's going to be some issues. Because you're going because you're hungry. It's like never food shopping when you're hungry, right? I'm sorry if that's crass, but it's true. If we look for friendship based on what we want in a friend, the friendships don't go that well. So maybe just a good dating relationship starts with what does it mean to be good friends? How do we pursue? What does God-modeled love look like? It's not me-centered. That takes a whole relearning anyway because everything in this world is me-centered, okay? So it's not me-centered first off. And then it's sustained and modeled on, on sacrifice, so going into dating, looking at if I'm going to be dating someone, it's not about, once again, what I can get out of this person. It's what I can do to get to know this person. It's what I can do even sacrificially. Now, this is where it gets into the physical and where it gets into just the practical of the boundaries we set with dating, that if God-modeled love is not all about my needs and it's mostly about sacrifice, then I need to be looking at when I'm planning things, when I'm deciding to ask a girl out or what I'm deciding to accept or what I'm deciding to get to know another guy, it's based on actually not what's the most I can get away with, but how much am I willing to sacrifice to meet this person in mind and heart. That no sacrifice is too far, whether my parents put, sacri put limits on it that seem like it's huge. For me, being underneath them for this season, how much am I willing to sacrifice? Because God-modeled love is about sacrifice whether it's the society and that has put um, sacrifice on us. Be being willing to shape it around, not how far can I push the boundaries, but how much am I willing to sacrifice? Because actually I'm so interested in getting to know that person, not because I have a need, but they're so valuable that any sacrifice isn't too great because I'm willing to do that. So I think that shifts the ball game anyway, and you can start to apply that practically, whether it's through physical boundaries, whether it's through time boundaries, whether it's through um, – text boundaries or word boundaries. And then, really, specifically when it comes to, um, I would say, physical boundaries, not starting anything, you cannot say, I'm not willing and I can't stop. That's what God-modeled love looks like. It's eternal. And I think, in a sense, there's certain things that's very clear in Scripture, obviously, sexual intercourse and all of those things that are obviously very, very clear. I think there are other physical things that having to do with your relationship with your parents the school that you are in, the boundaries of what um, public and private 
um, institutions put on you, you work within those things. And also, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a personal boundary as well. As you're a minor, always you go within your parents, I would say, and, and your school. But there's a personal boundary. For some people, okay, holding hands with someone does a lot to a person. And you know that person. For other people, it's fine. And their parents are fine with it. And they're fine. And they know where that boundary is. So I think, I'm sorry if that seems a little bit but I think that we need to start doing that more with our children and more with our youth is having conversations that maybe seem uncomfortable, that maybe seem like that was too long of an answer, to start going, how does that sound to you? Does that boundary seem ridiculous? If it does sound ridiculous, why? Is it because for you, you know, and actually, I'm going to be honest with you, Mom and I have been holding hands with girls since I was in sixth grade and you never knew about it and I'm fine? Or does it seem crazy because everybody else does it? Those are two different ways you engage with your young person. Does that make sense? So I think that that does give a good framework. What does relationship look like? What can we promise that is other focused based on how much am I willing to sacrifice and what is eternally sustainable? It's not me starting something, a commitment either with my heart or my body or my words or my time that I'm not willing to completely be eternal. Anyone else? may overlap a little bit, but could you uh, speak to cohabitation and uh, how it relates to kind of uh, 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 promiscuity and so forth, kind yeah. of even violating uh, the covenant of marriage and stuff? So Yeah. Okay. This is a huge one today, more than ever before. I don't necessarily think that it's actually um, that the practice has changed that much. I just don't think that it's hidden in society as much as it used to be. I think that a lot of people, especially when they, when they move from being young people and students and then maybe even university students and they start to get freedom from, from church and society and home in a way that's kind of completely a controlled environment, dormitories, people start dabbling in things. And then I just think most of us and a lot of Christians as well live with uh, a theology of what is practical and what is cost effective. And a lot of people go, well, really, we're engaged, or we're almost engaged. Our parents have blessed off on it. We're, you know, Christians. We know it's going to be fine. So we're just going to go ahead and live together. And I, I'm not saying all of that to say that's right. I'm just putting out there the reality of where we are. What I would say is, in a sense, it does overlap. I think that specifically cohabitation when it comes to just a guy and a girl who are either not yet engaged or even engaged and not married yet, you know, I, I, I think that you're, 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 it's always going to be more of a struggle. From that front, can I say two people, two Christians that are living together that haven't gotten married yet, they think it's not a struggle for them, I can make any type of Eternal judgment on them? Absolutely not. That's not what, uh, as much as I don't like that answer, because I know the reality of how hard it is to remain pure, right? What it means to be a Christian and our God, who is a God who walks us through brokenness and fallenness and things that we short circuit when we race into cohabitation too soon, I think he's a God of redemption. And he's a God who eternally loves us and bases our eternal output based on our relationship to him, not our behavior. Most of us feel uncomfortable with that, but that is the truth. What I would say, and this is a recent thing, the mingling of souls, Matt Chandler just wrote, if you're familiar with him, he actually is writing for married couples. He does do something for dating. I would say it's probably geared more towards um, young adult and university things, but he's done a lot of work looking at what we short circuit as human beings when we rush into physical intimacy. And not just what we short circuit in terms of our development as friendships, but waves into the generation of Christians that we now have where people have turned a blind eye and loads of people have been having sex even when they were in church, it happens, and nobody talked about it, and people were moving in together. The wave of marriage problems we now have because we short-circuited learning to talk to each other, learning to get through conflict without just making out loads, or short-circuited just deprivation and sacrifice financially early in life, learning to budget differently 
maybe not having the marriage or the first house we wanted because it cost a little bit more to have double rent for a long time, that goes a long way to building good blocks of having to navigate things later in marriage. So I think there's practical outweighs that we need to start wrestling with this again. There's definitely spiritual ones. And I forget the name of um, the, there's a famous monk, and he, it's a hilarious one. He basically says, um, it's more probable to see someone raised from the dead than to be able to lay next to a woman <laughs> and not become defiled. And I don't see many people raised from the dead. And this is like hundreds of years ago. I'm like, he said it right. It's just more probable to see someone raised from the dead. So I don't know if that crosses over to it. One thing I would say is that um, in different cultures, especially if you're traveling in Europe, or if you're doing different types of study abroad, like for instance, I was from a very, well, very strict background, and not only just no cohabitation, but no living within the same like house, even if it was shared housing of another guy was the way I was raised with. And university experiences just are not based that way in England. And I had to change, or I would have had nowhere to live. That God guided me through, um, and I was absolutely fine. And I think, I think the more our world is international and the more we see it, those situations will happen. I think we need to treat those very differently as well than our young people cohabitating. I think we as a body of Christ need to understand that there's differences, and that's where good conversation with our children. I'm not saying go ahead and push them into cohabitating doors. I think there's just different situations. Why I bring that up, though, is that actually I personally had to deal with, even I'm not telling lies here, the good girl. I never broke a rule. Like I cried if someone said I did something wrong with a wave of stigma from the church. Mm. She lived with boys in the UK. You know, people that just wouldn't even talk to my family anymore. My father's a minister because they viewed that as cohabitation. I think that's different, you know, an internship based in a church where there's seven different rooms and there's a mixed kind of thing. It's just different. So I just think let's be clear about our terms. My question is, why is divorce frowned upon or a really big issue? And would it be a bigger issue if the couple were or were not Christian? What's your name? Cordesia? That's a gorgeous name, Cordesia. I'm actually really glad you asked that question, okay? Because what I want to make sure that nobody heard when I said three things that Jesus set up was between a man and a woman, so talking about, you know, heterosexuality, sex within marriage, and then divorce. And then we hear the word divorce and we think, oh, my parents are divorced. Or someone here from a divorced background, or they are divorced. That happens. Why I bring up all those three is that they're so prevalent that it happens. That this shouldn't be a stigma that we say, you've done something and you're so fallen outside of God's love. Why I bring up these three is to say, for way too long, the Christian church in general has given a view to the rest of the world. We've taken what I believe is, if you read the original translation of 1 Corinthians 6, Cordasia, right? It says that um, sexual sins across, um, against the body are different, right? Just like it said. That, that, that they, they, and because of that, we have heard homosexuality, sex outside of marriage, have more of a weight before God and we have pinpointed those things in our society sometimes, pinpointed those things when we're talking to different people about coming to God and made people who have sinned in those areas sexually as worse sinners than someone who, say, lies or cheats or violates love in any other way. Every single time we choose to define our love and our life and our choices in life based on what we want rather than what God wants. That's all sin. The Bible's really clear that when we sexually sin, right, whether and when it's practicing sex outside of holy matrimony, right, or when divorce happens, that the ramifications are not greater before God because you've done something worse, that the brokenness that we feel really can be on someone's heart and body, I would even say, in a different way for much longer because it's that sacred, life-uniting thing that happens. Now, I also say that whenever there's great brokenness, and we see this with all of the miracles that Jesus does, whenever we see worse and painful brokenness, there's also the most beautiful, usually, 
opportunities for healing and redemption. The most beautiful thing. So I think the divorce, right, whether you're Christian or not, why it's singled out is so important is because the institution of marriage and the way that God ordained it is supposed to be sacred and precious and protected because it's supposed to give us this protection of here on earth in one relationship in a perfect unbroken world which we don't live in a safety of love that's always selfless that's sustained through sacrifice and that we don't have to be worried based on our performance or not based on how well we keep up our end of the bargain or not that it's going anywhere now even marriages that haven't fallen apart in divorce have times of struggling, of being at peace in those things, which is why we need God so much. And also I'd say one more step why marriage is so protected with all of those things is that it's the one place, whether or not it happens or not, where human life is supposed to be passed on. Now, of course, for all times it's happened outside of marriage. But you could arguably say not only is it protected because it mirrors a sacred love, and because it's life united and something physical and emotional and spiritual actually happens, but also that because God is the defender of love, what he wants for every child that comes into this world is to come into the world in the type of loving community that's selfless love, that's sacrificial love, and a love that is permanent. That, that child would have the potential of being able to know love and relationship in those safe settings. Once again, we live in a broken world. Most of us haven't had families like that, but God is the defender of love, which just because we might break those laws over and over again doesn't mean God didn't design, I would say, a perfect design for love to be defended and protected. Thanks for that question. It's really good. Anyone else? I know it's getting late, so I don't want to feel bad. Anyone whatsoever? Is there, and also, uh, if there's anything I said that you thought, mm, I'm not quite sure, this might leave my young person or me or someone here with a view of God that I'm not sure of, please ask. I'd rather you ask now. Um, we can deal with that. That's, that's why we do this everywhere. One last question. Why would I pursue a relationship or marriage if I should already be pouring myself out to my church, my family, why would, it, why would I want to pursue a relationship or, and also marriage? Good question. Remind me of your name. Alex. Alex. So Alex said, did you hear him? He was on the microphone. Why would I want to pursue a relationship if I'm already um, pouring myself up? That's a good question. Okay, that's, well, that's, that's a really good question. I think it's a question that people should actually ask themselves before they pursue any relationship. Should I be pursuing a relationship, and why am I pursuing a relationship? I think in general, like I started with, that we're hardwired for relationships as human beings, right? First off, relationship with God, but I think that the reason why Jesus boiled all of the commands down to not just love God and remain in these vertical bubbles of perfect kind of divine relationship but love others. So you already, in a sense, answered it. If a person is completely connected to God and they feel completely fulfilled and they're loving others and drawing wholesome relationship by serving and relating and, and, and maybe having deep soul friendship with other Christians, then in a sense, you are pursuing relationship. You're just not pursuing really romantic relationship. Does that make sense? So I think that the Christian and specifically the English word for love is very empty. There's so many different types of love. In fact, even God's love. In John, when it says perfect love casts out fear, perfect love is about rightly practiced love towards God that will always spill over into rightly practiced, and I would say even pursued love of other people. But love doesn't always mean romance. Love means deep soul friendship and relationship. Love means service. Love means um, romance sometimes. Love means commitment somewhere to someone and something other than yourself. Does that make sense? So I would say no one should have to pursue romantic relationship if they don't feel that they want to make those commitments long term. That's what Paul said, you know? 
I would that everybody would just get on with the task and be like me, you know? And some people think that he had a marriage at one point and then maybe she died. Some people think he was celibate his whole life. It depends. However, if you're hungry for it, first answer the question, why am I hungry for it? God created me hungry for relationship. He doesn't say it's a bad thing. As long as I'm first pulling that hunger satisfaction from him, then I'm going to go and pursue love and relationship modeled after the way he did it. Because God told us that it's okay for us to pursue relationship through friendships for marriage, if that's what we're called to. But I think you're asking good questions. And I think sometimes with not that not being voiced is um, a real reason why people buy into the, lo- the lie. Well, we should be able to practice sex and relationship with whomever we want, whenever we want. Because if not, then we're being cheapened or cheated out of the greatest experience of life. Absolutely not. The greatest experience of life is to know God's love and love others. But love doesn't always mean sex. It actually, rarely, love doesn't mean sex. Love doesn't mean romance. Love means relationship, sacrifice, and sustained person um, eternally. So good question. All right. I think that was it. Thank you so much, guys.